Hello everyone, it's your brother in Christ, Diamond Dustification from YouTube again. And right off the bat, I want to thank everyone that prayed for me about my insomnia issues. I do want to tell you that they have been effectual and I have gotten some sleep, so thank you very much for that. I'm still recovering from a couple of other issues, etc., but today I wanted to come on here and make a video about a topic that I'm sure each and every single one of you has spoken about on numerous occasions throughout their uh, your walk with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, okay? And that topic is very simple. We're going to ask ourselves a very basic question. What does grace mean? Okay. Now, each and every one of you probably said gift immediately. At least I wouldn't be surprised if you did. But we're going to take a look at this from a, a much deeper look. Okay. In a previous video recently that I have done, a teaching video, I said that sin is one of the most major problems in our lives, and that's absolutely true. I mean, it's obvious, okay? That's why Jesus Christ died on the cross, to, that, that he may bear our sins and we may bear his righteousness, okay? He took our sins upon himself. But we still have this flesh nature clinging to us, which we are promised to be delivered from, okay? <clears throat> when we are raptured and taken up to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and God the Father. And that promise is a surety. We must divide between the salvation of the soul and the spirit and the salvation of the body. Okay, there, there are two different things. And if you don't um, make a division there, you're going to be dragged into all sorts of heresy and false doctrine. However, a lack of understanding the grace of God is likewise just as dangerous. Because when people don't understand grace and the deeper nuances there... That's what leads them to fall into heresy, like losing salvation or, or partial rapture. we got to be ready for the rapture of our own faithfulness, okay? Now, there are many verses in the Bible that talk about watching and being prepared. But we have to ex examine what those mean. First of all, who is it written to? That's the first question we need to ask. Is it talking about individuals that are already in the tribulation that need to watch and be prepared as per Matthew 25, which we've already talked about? Or is it talking about us now in the New Testament in this age of grace, where we want to watch and take heed to ourselves that our faith be genuine? Ask ourselves the question, what is our faith being placed in? Are we putting it in ourselves? Are we putting it in our gifts or something else or in our own faithfulness? Or are we putting our faith solely in Jesus Christ and the penalty he paid on the cross to save us? Okay. The Bible warns us over and over again, that a genuine believer is kept by the power of God. But if somebody draws back unto perdition, he will have no pleasure in them. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Okay? That's what it says. There are two groups there. We've talked about that over and over again. That is Hebrews 10, 38 through 39. However, grace as it is defined in the Bible appears in G5485, okay? That is the word for grace in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. So let's take a look at that and see if we can discover exactly what God is telling us. What is grace? Well, the concordance reads as thus. From G463, which I have listed here, gracious, graciousness as gratifying of a manner or act, abstract or concrete, literal, figurative, or spiritual, especially the divine influence upon the heart. Now that one's very interesting. And it's reflection in the life. The reflection of the divine influence upon the heart, including gratitude, acceptable, benef benefit, favor, gift, grace, joy, liber liberty, pleasure, thank, and worthy. Okay? So the divine influence upon the heart reflects itself in our lives with joy, liberty, pleasure, and thankfulness, which is what? The fruits of the Spirit. But our faithfulness does determine how much we enjoy the liberty that we have been given in Christ. And we're going to see that as we go forward here. But let's see if we can define grace based upon what it says in the concordance. If you haven't already read this, we're going to read it now. Here is how I see it. In an act of graciousness, God sent his only begotten son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to die in our place on the cross of Calvary, that all those who believe and trust in him receive the free gift of salvation. By the divine influence upon the heart, we are drawn to this act of mercy accomplished by Jesus Christ, and by the process of faith, we come to the end of ourselves and believe. Okay? So the divine influence upon the heart gives men a recognition of, of their need for a savior. That is why it says many are called, but few are chosen. Now, when it says chosen, it doesn't mean that we were chosen in the sense that God is a respecter of persons. And if you believe that it does, then you are contradicting the word. 
you are saying that God is a respecter of persons when it clearly says that he is not. Okay? Everybody that goes to hell will be without excuse. They will not be able to say who has resisted his will as they tried to in Romans 9. That was the point that Paul was making. Everybody that goes to heaven is not going to be able to say that they got there because of something that they did, whether it be before they came to the cross or after. You know what I don't understand about people that talk about Ephesians 2 8 and 10, through 10 all the time is that they will say that they believe that they are saved by faith alone, that Jesus Christ completely and totally accomplished their salvation, but, but they'll add a but. Now we must be faithful in order to attain that which was promised because they are misapplying and misunderstanding the verses in the Bible which speak about endurance of the faith. That endurance of the faith is reflective of God's endurance and faithfulness. Okay, If a man does not endure in the faith, then he is one of the bad seeds. He is a tear among the wheat. There are two types of people in the church, tares and wheat. There are no middle ground. There's no middle ground. There's no half wheat, half tare. There's no abstract number of sins that you can commit that will, that will separate you from the love of God. There is nothing that can take you out of his hand. The Holy Spirit will be with you how long? Forever. Jesus said it himself. It said, no man may boast in heaven. If you are saving, if you're keeping yourself saved, by your own faithfulness, that is a that is a process by which you will be able to boast. Okay, It doesn't matter how you spin it. You will be able to stand before God in heaven and say that Jesus Christ saved me in totality, but by my own faithfulness, I, I laid hold upon, upon his saving grace and your saving grace and kept it by my own power. That is a boast. If you don't see it, I don't know what to tell you. But we were drawn to Christ and given Christ by the divine influence upon our hearts, made, made aware of our need for a Savior. Now, some men don't, don't accept that. When they are made aware of their need for a Savior, they do not accept that reality. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. What do they turn to? They turn to the law. They turn to other things. They, they remove things from the gospel. Okay? They create their own God and their own G or their own Jesus. That is the problem here. But we that have truly believed and trusted in the gospel, in what Jesus Christ accomplished, we are made acceptable in the beloved and gifted with eternal life and worthiness thereof in Christ Jesus. Therefore, the joy, the liberty, the pleasures and thankfulness that accompanies this salvation are ours for the taking. In spite of the troubles, we are promised to face. And that is the definition of grace as I see it. Okay? Every single one of us is told that we will endure much trouble in this life. We will also endure chastening in this life because sin, the sin nature is still with us in the flesh. Even though we have been circumcised from it, it is constantly rebelling against the spirit and the spirit is waging war against the flesh. If we grieve the spirit, we do not lay hold upon the joy, the liberty, and the pleasures and thankfulness that accompanies our salvation. And that's why there are many Christians out there that are very, very miserable. Okay, because they are not laying hold upon the comforts that God would, would give them. It, Paul said it himself, we are pressed on all sides, but yet we are thankful. Okay, despite, despite the, the misery that he was going through. Let me see if I can find that verse. Excuse me. That is, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not despair. Not in despair, per persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9. Okay. And there are some that despaired of life in the Bible as well. That we despaired even of life. 2 Corinthians 1, 8. Very interesting. That we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired even of life. So if you read that and then you look at it, in comparison to what we just examined there, it almost seems like a contradiction, but it's not. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. But see, the, the excellency of the power is of God, not us. The treasure that we have in this earthen vessel is the Holy Spirit of God. And that's why we are not in despair and not destroyed and not forsaken, because he will never leave us nor forsake us. So even though we may despair of life, God will always recover his saints in some manner, shape, or form. 
Now, there is such a thing as a Christian who has drawn back, but not unto perdition. There's a difference between drawing back and drawing back unto perdition. They're two different things. A man that draws back unto perdition has seen the light of life. He has looked upon Jesus Christ. He has seen the way, the truth, and the life, but then he departs from it. He puts it from himself. That's what, what is said of the Pharisees. Okay, in Acts. Seeing as you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Okay? It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. Who did he come for? The Jews. But then, lo, he turned to the Gentiles. So your, your, your faithfulness is not going to determine whether or not you're going to be saved. Your race in this wor world is not going to determine your salvation. And if you are saying that it will, then what you're saying is that it is not a gift, but a prize. People run a race for a prize. They do not run a race for a gift. If you want to apprehend the things that Jesus Christ would give you, the liberty, the joy, and the pleasures and thankfulness that accompany your salvation, if you want to apprehend the, the knowledge so that you might teach others, if you want to be raised up as an instrument of God, then you have to yield in obedience and apprehend that for which you have been called. Now, you've been called unto salvation, but you've also been called to obedience. You can't deny that. There's no denying it. We have not been called to live a life of sin, debauchery, or otherwise. And if we do, we're going to be chastised severely. So let's keep going here and prove the point. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Okay? So in other words, the gifts that we have been given of grace, not salvation here, but the gifts of Christ, is according to the measure of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath, get, hath dealt to every man that the measure of faith. We are all different. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one in the body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Romans 12, 3 through 5. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou had not received it? There's many Christians out there that seem to elevate themselves because they add to them, they add their own faithfulness. They add their own prowess as they see it to the gifts of God. No, it doesn't matter how unintelligent or intelligent you claim to be or think yourself to be. None of that matters. The worldly wisdom is foolishness unto God. All of the wisdom that you have is in the spirit is of the spirit. You are only able to spiritually discern in the first place because you have the spirit. Even Romans 8 says that. These men cannot be submitted to the law of God because they are not saved. They do not have the Holy Spirit within them. They do not recognize the light. The cross is foolishness unto them that perish. But unto us who believe, it is the power of God. Okay? Preaching is foolishness. To them that perish. The preaching of the cross is foolishness. Excuse me. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18 Okay? So, so grace is a gift. In this particular instance, it's talking about the graciousness of the gifts that are bestowed upon the saints. Did you receive a gift of teaching or prophecy? Maybe a gift of tongues? Don't look down upon others who have not the same gift, and don't boast of your gift as though you didn't receive it. That's not written in there for no reason. There's plenty of people that go around and say, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. No. A man is saved based upon whether or not he truly believes the gospel. Jesus Christ didn't say, believe and speak in tongues. He said, believe in me. He that believeth has passed from death unto life. He didn't say, he that believeth and speak in tongues. He didn't say, he that believeth and teacheth. He didn't say, he that believeth and do this or that. He said, he that believeth hath passed from death unto life. Over and over again, all throughout the Bible. And the most potent one is, in my opinion, is John 5, 24. Verily, verily, which is an assurance twice given. I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Present tense, 
and shall not future tense come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. Jesus Christ literally said that you have it and you will not come into condemnation ever again. Right there. So anybody that says you can lose salvation is, is calling Jesus Christ a liar. Plain as day. We are justified by grace as well. So grace means, in a sense, justification. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So the justification of grace points towards the redemption and justification of Jesus Christ. In other words, they are one and the same. For by grace are you saved through faith. Okay? Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now what I meant by what I just said there is that grace, faith, and Jesus Christ are one and the same thing. Because you can't, you can't come to Jesus Christ without being made to understand your need for a Savior. The law is our schoolmaster to point to our need for Christ, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So by the divine influence upon the heart, we are drawn to Jesus Christ. And the method by which we are saved is faith, genuine saving faith, which God leads us unto. In what? In Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ, the sacrifice he made on the cross of Calvary. So when we say we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, that's what we mean. These things are inseparable from one another. You can't separate grace from Jesus Christ. You can't separate faith from Jesus Christ. And you can't separate Jesus Christ from grace and faith. All three are one. And they go together. Without the grace of God, Jesus Christ wouldn't have come. Without faith, we do not attain unto that which we have been given freely. We must accept the gift. And we have it. That is the choice that we make of our free will. Accept it or deny it. And we can deny it in many, many different ways, as I've already talked about, through the law, through elevating our, ourselves, through just simple denial, choosing the deeds of darkness over that of light, because we do not want to be reproved. We do not want to be made a, aware of our sin and are made to come to a sense to it by the schoolmaster. We deny it there before we ever even learn about Jesus Christ. or And we sin willfully. Okay? Hebrews 10, Hebrews 6. Simple as that. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We stand in grace. We stand in Jesus Christ and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Take heed lest he fall. There are many verses that say that. What do you stand in? Well, grace. What, it, what would it mean to fall? Well, walk out of grace. Go to the law. Go to something else other than Jesus Christ. Anything. That would mean to fall. But nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to, to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. There is neither Jew nor Greek in the body of Christ. The promise is sure to all the seed. It doesn't say the promise might be to all the seed. It is sure. The promise is sure. What promise? What have you been promised? Eternal life. You have eternal life now. So the promise here. There's two, like I said, two salvations. There's the salvation of the body that we wait for and groaneth along with all the, the world, the creatures of the world. And there's the salvation of the spirit and the soul, which is already attained. We're seated with him in heavenly places. Colossians 1, we have been translated into the kingdom of heaven already. We are in the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That seed is incorruptible. And that's why John says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Why do you think John can say that? You see, if you're going to sit there and say that we can commit this, the sin that is talked about in Hebrews 10, then you're contradicting John. We sinneth not in that way. We draw not back unto perdition, because the seed is incorruptible. If the seed could be corrupted, and we could draw back under perdition and lose our salvation, then first, then Peter's a liar and John's a liar. And so is Paul and all the other apostles and even Jesus Christ himself. But if one of the apostles was a liar, Jesus Christ would be a liar because they wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Simple as that. You are the incorruptible seed. 
Do you understand? You are an incorruptible seed. You have been seated with him in heavenly places. So when the Bible says, endureth to the end, it's talking about the faithfulness of God. That's why it says that the good seed that lands on good soil produces fruit. I'm not talking about the fruit of good works here. I'm talking about the one that works in you to do into will of his good pleasure. That is the one thing that every Christian has. If you don't have any conflict in yourself, that's a problem. Now, conflict can look a lot of different ways. Maybe you don't, you feel miserable when you commit a sin, or maybe you just feel a, a slight tug. But there's something different, whether you're apathetic or you're not. You know that there is a conviction there to righteousness, not to condemnation. There's a big difference there. That is the work of the Holy Spirit and the chastisement of God at work on you. Okay? John is not talking about that we never, ever, ever sin at all, period. No. Because John said in the very first chapter that he that says he has no sin is deceived and the truth is not in him. He is, he is able to say these two things simultaneously because he is making a division between the body, the soul, and the spirit. If you do not divide between the three, you are going to fall into heresy because you're going to say that the future salvation of the body is the salvation of the spirit and the soul. And therefore, if your salvation is future, you have to be faithful to earn it. No. The salvation of your spirit and your soul is already sealed in Christ Jesus of an incorruptible seed. The salvation of your body is guaranteed because faithful is he that calleth you who will preserve you. What does it mean to be preserved? What are you being preserved from? From corruption. There's no other way to look at that verse. Are we going to be preserved blameless and then come into blame when Jesus Christ comes for us and be condemned in that blame? We're blameless, but then we come into blame? It doesn't make any sense. Preserved blameless. Faithful is he, not you. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all inequity, not some inequity, not past inequity, not present tense inequity, but all. And purifying to himself a peculiar people. So he's purifying us after he redeems us, zealous of good works. These things, things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. He wants to make us zealous of good works and purify us unto himself. Are you yielding to that purification? Are you letting him do that? Or are you grieving the spirit within yourself? Well, even the chastisement of God is him at work trying to purify you. But he wants you to work with him. Okay? Not turn away from chastisement as those in 1 Corinthians 11 did, to the destruction of their bodies, but the saving of their souls. Thank the Lord. We are led by grace and provided mercy. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and to help in time of need. Now this is pointing us back to what John said in 1 John 1. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And yet in the same exact epistle here, he says, but if we walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, some people say, well, we have to walk in the light. Therefore, we can stop walking in the light. No, the previous verse says the exact opposite. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So the reason that we walk in the light is because we do the truth and Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, to be a child of light, believe in the light. Okay, I show that all the time here. Okay. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may be children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. John 12, 36. Walking in the light is a passive reality. If you are in the light, it is because you are genuinely saved and do the truth. If you walk in darkness, you are not saved. And you are producing the fruits of darkness because your father is of the de your father is the devil. Simple as that. 
We have been cleansed from all of our sins, and yet we are told to confess our sins at the same time. There's a difference between repentance from unbelief to belief and a confession of sin. We confess our sins, that we find that we be not judged. Okay? And I'm not talking about judgment unto condemnation. The exact opposite. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened to the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. That's the difference between repentance and confession. Okay? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. For the grace of God bringeth salvation, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Okay? Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you'd abound in this grace also. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Absolutely. Yield to the Holy Spirit, go on into perfection, and add to these things. Now there's two types of perfection. Okay? Excuse me. Now here is the is in Philippians 3:15 we are shown this. As many let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded and if anything ye be otherwise minded God shall reveal even this unto you. Now perfect is G5046 in the concordance which says complete. In various applications of labor, growth, mental and moral character Full age, of a full age, completeness, man, perfect. And the previous verse says, is talking about his pressing towards the mark of the high calling of God. And if you continue to go up to verse 312, you get this. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that, for, all, for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Okay? So it's very simple here. Now, if we go over to Hebrews 10, 10, 10, we see this. For he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. That is, we have been completed. He has accomplished it. He has consummated it. He has consecrated it, finished and fulfilled it. He has made us perfect, perfected forever them that are sanctified. And we are sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. But let us return to Philippians 2. Because there's an interesting thing that we need to examine there. Excuse me, Philippians 3. He runs. Okay. Because he does not count himself as already perfect in this sense. So in other words, what, what Paul is saying here is he runs with a tenacity. As though he had not already been perfected. But he wants to apprehend something that for which also he is apprehended of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ has apprehended Paul. That means that Jesus Christ has put his Holy Spirit in him. He has bought and paid for him. And Paul knows that he has been apprehended. But he does not count himself to have apprehended the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, the mark and the prize. Okay? And then he tells everybody to, that is mature to walk in this same fashion. Okay? Okay? And then he says at the end, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is, even, he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Okay? He doesn't count himself as perfect in the body. But he does count himself as perfect in the spirit, in the soul. And he presses towards the mark of his ministry that has been granted unto him. And he tells all others to be perfect in this way, to grow, go on into maturity and to add to their faith these things. Either salvation is a gift or it is a prize. But it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So if you're going to sit here and tell me that you're going to insist that Paul is running this race for his salvation, then you are contradicting him. Romans 9.16 speaks very clearly to this. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Okay? Now, we are given hope in patience by grace. 
Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Wait a minute. Everlasting? An everlasting consolation and good hope? So we, if we could fall out of that consolation and hope, it wouldn't be everlasting. And therefore, this is yet another confirmation of our eternal security. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So it is God which is going to comfort our hearts and establish us in every good word and work. Not us. Interesting. What does Psalms 92, 1 through 5 say? It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night, upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, has made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great is, are thy works and, are, and thy thoughts are very deep. You are the work of God. And, and, and God has promised that he will complete that work. For it is God which worketh in you, both the will and do do of his good pleasure, which they always leave out. They love to quote Philippians 2.12, but they'll never quote 2.13 because it leads us straight into 1.6, which says, we can be confident of this very thing, that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So God has given you an everlasting consolation and you will triumph in the works of his hands. You have been made a vessel unto honor, not dishonor, or a vessel of mercy, I should say. Not of wrath. Will God fumble as he, is, as he has created his vessel of mercy and accidentally created into a vessel of wrath? Will he fail? Let us think about Joseph for a second here. Joseph was given dreams of what was going to come to pass in his life. The betrayal, the things that occurred in Egypt. Those dreams were a confirmation by God that they were ordained to happen. So when God says that he has ordained us, just as he did the apostles themselves, chosen us and ordained us that we should go and bring forth fruit and that our fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name he may give to you. Are you going to call him a liar by saying that his, or, that his ordaining that will not come to pass? And then we have to ask ourselves, what fruit? Well, it's inward fruit. He's working in us to get us to do that which is outward, but we can grieve him, the Holy Spirit, that is. Okay? And that's why Matthew 7 says every good tree produces good fruit because they are producing the fruit of saving faith. So if you're going to tell me that we can lose salvation after reading Psalms 92, 1 through 5 and 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 through 17, you are calling God a liar and a failure. And you can try and spin it any way you want. But God is the one that is doing the work. I, every time I say that you're calling God a failure, they will shoot back instantly saying, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. Well, yeah, you are. You don't realize that you're doing it because you don't understand what you're talking about because you don't under divide between body, soul, and spirit. You don't understand that endurance comes from God. And you go around and you preach when you ought not to be. You are not a teacher. You are not risen up as an instrument of God and yet you are claiming that. Because it has not been given you. And you are going to be ashamed at his coming. And that's if you're saved. Lord help you if you're not. Because he that causes the little ones to stumble, it would be better for a millstone to be tied around his neck. Think about that. Having a millstone tied around your neck and being thrown into the depths of the sea. The amount of fear and pain you would be in. Why would Christ say that it would be better to have that happen to you than to strip the little ones? Think very carefully about what you're preaching before you copy and paste your nonsense. Because you will give an account for every idle word. And it is an idle word of darkness to preach heresy. And don't think that I'm so arrogant that I don't think I'll give an account myself. I do. I do believe that I have probably gotten things wrong before. When? When I wasn't yielding to the Holy Spirit like I should. Wasn't praying enough. Wasn't, just wasn't paying attention. When I was straining. That's the flesh. I know that in spite of my failures, I will be forgiven because I have been forgiven. I know that the Holy Spirit, to him belongs my ministry, to God belongs my ministry. Okay? 
And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. So you're going to sit here and tell me that I can depart from the love of God based upon your misinterpretation of Jude. Okay? Which is talking about saving people with fear. Saving the lost with fear. Telling them what awaits them if they turn not unto God in, the, in due season. And you're going to try and tell me that applies to me as a believer when God clearly does not want us to dwell in a slavish fear of him, to shrink back from his grace as if we are terrified of him all the time. Fear and trembling is rejoice and reverence. No child I know of lives in consistent and constant fear of his parents. He loves them, he embraces them, and he reveres them. And he believes that they hold the truth. What child doesn't trust their parents when their parents are truly godly men and women? A true household that is, that is yielding to the obedience of Christ is one that, that is a beautiful thing to behold. And, and all there are holy in the continents. But a household of devils that walks in darkness, what do you see there? Vitriol, hatred, fear. Fear hath torment and leads to mental disorder. You think God wants you to be in torment of, all the time? He that is in torment by this fear has not been perfected in love. There is no fear in love. God is love. And you have entered into that love. There is no fear in that love. So if you're going to tell me that you need to be afraid of God and God says there is no fear in love John, through John, then you're a liar. Because perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You know what that means? Well, 1 John 4 is all about what? The differences between the lost and the saved. Everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God, and there is no fear in that love, and God is love. Now, I'm not saying that a saint can't be afraid every now and again. Of, I'm scared that I don't have salvation. I'm scared of chastisement. I'm scared of this. That's the flesh. But if you're preaching fear to the flock, fear of partial rapture, because we're going to be, we're going to, only some are going to go in the rapture because it's a reward for self-righteousness. If you're preaching fear that we're going to lose our salvation because you don't understand the scriptures, your doctrine is false. End of discussion. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Colossians 1 11. De Deuteronomy 36. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with th that thou mayest livest. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. Deuteronomy 36. Wait, 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 wait. What's the commandments that Jesus Christ left us? All the laws fulfilled. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, he says. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love the, thy neighbor as thyself. And yet in Deuteronomy 36, it says the Lord will circumcise our heart, give us a new heart in the new covenant to love the Lord thy God with all heart, soul, and mind. Well, it says heart and soul. That thou mayest liveth. Hmm? But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. That applies just as much to us, neither Jew nor Greek. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. We are not going to be made ashamed of the hope that has been given us. That would mean that we're going to lose it and we would be ashamed of that hope. For example, Let's say somebody makes a promise to you to appear at a certain day, at a certain time, at a certain place. And you go there and then you're made ashamed because they, they didn't keep that promise. Well, God says that's not going to happen to you, to you who are saved, to us who are saved, okay? He will be there. He will come for us. And, it, and because that love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. It's also pointing us straight towards Deuteronomy 36. We will not be ashamed because we will be kept in the love of God. And that's why it says we can never be separated from it. 
So you want to go back to Jude now, right? Save with fear. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Jude 121. Okay, well, Jude 121 can't be used to rest the scriptures and say that Paul lied in Romans 8, 38 to 39, which says we shall never be separated from the love of God, neither by death nor life. That means none of the things in life that, that occur in our lives, nothing of our lives can separate us from the love of God. Nothing of death can separate us from the love of God either. Because death has already been defeated, though it is the last enemy to be defeated. You understand? He has triumphed already, Jesus Christ. He has overcome the world and the wicked principalities. You count within this right here, this clause, neither death nor life shall separate us from the love of God. Your life, no matter what happens, will ever, nothing that can happen and it will ever separate you from the love of God. Nothing that is present, that exists in reality, no power in existence, nor nothing that shall come, not, not, nothing that is high, nothing that is above, or any other creature for that matter, shall be able to separate you from the love of God. And if you have the love of God, you are born again. That is an absolute guarantee. Paul wrote that to show you that you are more than a conqueror through him that loved you. And that's why John says, we overcometh by faith in him. But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And then you got these people going around saying we can lose salvation. Liar. We can be blotted out of the book of life. Liar. What does it say? Who keeps the word? Revelations, the, the end chapter of Revelation speaks about a man that doesn't, any man changes the word of God. Who is, what is the definition of a person that keeps the word? Well, according to the differences between the seed, it is the seed that lands on good soil that has the root and bears the root, or rather that is the root of Jesus Christ. I am the root and the offspring of David. Liars. Let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Okay? That you may, in various applications of labor and growth and mental and moral character, grow into completeness and maturity in God. Strain towards the goal, which we've already talked about here. For many walk. Let's continue on after Paul spoke about the race here. Be, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Ephesians 2.2, 2, wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You're going to sit there and try and tell me that the children of disobedience are saved Christians that are disobeying, that are walking in sin and struggling? No. In time past ye walked, past tense. The reason Paul can say that is because we have been circumcised from our sinful flesh by Jesus Christ putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You can't go back into your flesh in that sense. They're resting the scriptures by going to Galatians 5, which is talking about a mature walk and trying to say that it's talking about the separation walk. The separation walk means that you have been separated from your flesh. You are no longer are occupied by the spirit of Antichrist, by the prince of the power of the air among whom also we ha all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But we became what? A new creature in Christ. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, and we will not be ashamed of that love, even when we were dead in sin, he made us alive, quickened us together with Christ. By faith are ye saved. We are been reanimated, born again. By faith, by grace, are you saved, okay? By grace, are you saved. Hello? You are not a child of disobedience. You're going to sit there and try and tell me Philippians 3.18 means we can lose our salvation? No. Against whom do you sport yourselves? Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Are ye not the children of transgression, a seed of falsehood? Hmm? Because we are born again... Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by what? The word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God liveth and abideth forever. And ye are the body of Christ, and Jesus Christ is the word. 
He is the one that abides. He is the one that is faithful. He is the one that endureth. So when he tells you, if you endure, he's making a statement. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. The tares will not endure. The children of the kingdom will. But these individuals, these children of disobedience, they are of their father, the devil, and the lust of their fathers are of their father they will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. John 8, 44. Simple as that. Eternal security is proved all throughout this video. I could I could in this in this right here, and we're going to be talking about Matthew 18 again in the future, even though I've already spoken about that. But let's keep going here. Grace is a gift and unmerited favor. In whom also ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. That right there, those two verses are a direct application of how you get saved. It is a step-by-step -step guide. You trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And whom also after that you believed, you were sealed. So after you trusted and believed because of hearing of the hearing of the truth, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the guarantee, earnest, of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. And the reasons Ephesians 4.30 4 says you have been sealed unto the day of redemption is because the day of redemption of your body, your glorification, the purchased possession. Very simple. Your spirit and your soul has been redeemed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us all with spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Every single one of us was shapen in inequity. Psalms 51.5 Behold, I was shapen in inequity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. But God commendeth his love toward us. Romans 5.8-11 through 11. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, will be. Remember that the word shall means guarantee. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So if when we were in so much darkness, God saved us anyway, in spite of ourselves, how dare we, any of us, say that we can't, that we, he will fail to reconcile us by his life? That is the life of Christ, which you have. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. You want to tell me that this is talking about we haven't received the atonement? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Received it. Given. Laid hold upon. We lay hold upon Christ for maturity. We are sealed unto the day of redemption of the glorification of our bodies, but yet our spirit and our soul is of an incorruptible seed. The divine influence upon the heart accepted and preserved in, be in the beloved Jesus Christ, or beloved. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Because you are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. 1 Peter 1, 2. Through the sanctification of the spirit unto obedience. Unto and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The obedience of what? The gospel. Because that's what gives us the, the blood. We are saved through the blood which is clearly said in Romans 5, 9. Okay? Justified by what? His blood. By his sacrifice. By what he did on the cross. Okay? Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Matthew, Matthew 22, 14 and Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. For many are called, but few are chosen, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So we were chosen to be holy and without blame before him. 
and yet we're going to come into blame? We're not preserved blameless? You're going to tell me that we can lose our salvation? You're going to tell me that we can be left behind in the rapture because we're, we come into blame? Even though we have been predestinated under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will? Jesus Christ to himself. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Preserved? In Jesus Christ? So what does it mean when we're preserved blameless? Well, it means we're preserved in Jesus Christ, which points towards what? The salvation of the spirit and the soul, which is already attained and guaranteed because you are the body of Christ. There is no sin in Christ. You are incorruptible seed. So if no sin can be imputed under the spirit and the soul, how could you possibly lose salvation? And what else is preserved in there? The body. In the body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is faithful. He will do it. Because he has paid the penalty for your sins. And if you do sin, we have what? An advocate who intercedeth for us. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Psalms 138 and 8. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the work of thine own hands. Who is the, what, what does that mean? God that showeth mercy hath not the potter power over the clay of, of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. And that he might make known the riches of the glory of the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. Glorification. He will not forsake us nor leave us. Hebrews 13. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Forsake not the work of thine own hands. Do you still think you can lose your salvation? No. We've already read uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23-24. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. So wait a minute. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's slow down there. We are favored in the same way that Mary was favored. You know how we, how we always say that God won't kill his own child? Let me ask you a question. Do you think that Mary could have somehow lost his lost his favor, and if so, Jesus Christ would have killed himself in the womb? I know it's a terrible thing to think about, but think, consider it. Would he have killed himself in the womb and picked someone else? Or maybe God would have just disintegrated her? Or is it more likely that chosen in foreknowledge, Mary was endowed with the grace of God just as we are in a way and kept by his favor? Favor, that the favor that Mary received connects to G5485, which goes straight back to what? By grace are ye saved. So we have the same exact favor that Mary had. And you're going to tell me that you can lose it? Yourself? No. We have been given gratitude and thankfulness as we lay hold upon it. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be thankful. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Rejoice, pray without ceasing, and rejoice evermore. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Over and over again, God has confirmed himself unto us. We already know from Deuteronomy that we fulfill the law of love because we have Jesus Christ within us, shedding the love of, of God abroad by the Holy Spirit given unto us. We are the body of Christ. We are in the body of Christ. God has placed the Holy Spirit within us as our guide and our keeper and our seal. And, and God is our keeper. You understand? Great peace have they which love the, thy law and nothing shall offend them. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. 
Now we are under the law of love. And that law is not what saves us. Every single one of us has a love for God, lest we not be believers. If we didn't love God, we, wouldn't, we couldn't call ourselves believers. But we confuse our love with man's love. We say, oh, I don't feel like I love God. Well, faith isn't a feeling. Faith is not a feeling. It's a decision. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and then the love of God comes in and sheds itself abroad in your heart. And it's a process. None of us fulfill the law in love and perfection. That's why we're always told to forgive. And the Bible warns us, if we don't forgive, neither shall we be forgiven. Now, is that saying that we're not we're going to lose our salvation? No. But you can't expect God to not chastise you. You can't go to him in, in confession when you're not willing to forgive your own brothers and sisters. You've offended God by grieving the Spirit. So if you go to him and you confess that, and you apologize, but then straight away you go and you you take someone by the neck that has offended you, then God is not going to forgive you that. He's going to chastise you. Now, you're forgiven in your salvation sense. But you are judged that ye be not judged. So if you do not judge yourself, if you refuse to judge the self, then you shall be chast chastened of the Lord. Okay? If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. The comforter has come into us to help guide us into the keeping of the commandments of love. And he is going to be with us how long? Is For a little while? Until we sin too much? Until we grieve him out of us? Until we overcome the grace of God? No. Forever. Forever means forever. It's right there in front of your face. G165. From the same as G104, an age. Okay? Course, eternal, forever. G1519. Throughout, till the end. So after forever, then you can talk about how you'll lose the Holy Spirit. And where did I get both of those concordance words? Well, if we go there and we look at the word forever, we see that both show up. Okay? G165. And G1519. Okay? He is able to save us to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for, for them. He is making intercession for us, which means that our future sins, he is interceding on our behalf. Anybody that ever tells you, oh, your future sins aren't forgiven, well, Hebrews 7, 24 through 25 disagrees. We want to keep ourselves in the love of God. Even though we know That that love is taught and given unto us. Okay, we want to keep ourselves in it in it by yielding to the Holy Spirit. Because when we look at uh, Acts eleven twenty three and First John five eighteen, what do we see? Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. We know it that whatso whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Keep yourselves in the love of God. He that is begotten keepeth himself. I, the Lord, do keep it. I will water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I will keep it night and day. Fury is not in me who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle. I would go through them. I would burn them together. Or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. He shall cause them that come out of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. That applies just as much to you. Whose strength is it? The joy of the Lord is your strength. For the mystery of inequity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. He is not going to let inequity rule you, to take you back. He is not going to let Satan invade his house and steal his child, or kill it, for that matter. Kill you. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thine heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. So when people say you can remove yourself from the love of God in blatant contradiction to the word of God, which we've already discussed over and over again, they do not understand the word. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for faithful is he that promised. 
And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. But Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence in the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? And we will because faithful is he that promised. We're going to look at this verse a little bit more. We will be preserved blameless. We will be kept from falling. And Hebrews 10.35 brings it up again if we hold fast the confidence. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Interesting. Is salvation a reward? For ye have need of patience that will be delivered us, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back under perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So the reason that we will hold fast our confidence and we will hold fast in patience is because we are our, the Lord directs our hearts into patience because we have believed to the saving of the soul, and therefore we will not draw back under perdition. So if you're going to tell me that Hebrews 3.6 is talking about losing salvation, then you are just manifesting that you have no idea what you're talking about. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should come short of it, because the word preached did not profit them, not being missed with faith in them that heard it. The gospel was preached unto us as well as unto them. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. An evil heart of unbelief can exist within a man that claims to be a believer. And it often does, unfortunately. Because they believe that their salvation is based upon the changes that they manifest within themselves, or their supposed changes, but re in reality there are none. So your salvation is not dependent upon how good you are outwardly. There's plenty of wolves in sheep's clothing that can put on a good show. It's not about having a, a good conversation or being faithful. It's about being preserved in Christ Jesus, led into all patience, into all love, which will not be which will not ashamed you or leave you ashamed. You will hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end, precisely because you are preserved in Jesus Christ. And it is faith and he is faithful that is promised. He will preserve you blameless. He will keep you from falling. But if that confidence begins to waver and wavers away completely and in totality, and you walk away from the faith, you are manifesting not that you lost your salvation, but that you never had it. On the other hand, if you draw back and you are, still, and you are suffering as a Christian because of so, many, so much turmoil that has come upon your life, that doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. It means you're suffering. You will not draw back under perdition, however, because for the same reason that St. Peter didn't draw back under perdition, because Jesus Christ was faithful and prayed for him that his faith fail not. And he said with absolute certainty about Peter that in spite of what happened that night, he would be converted from this sin of denial and strengthen his brethren, which he did. And he didn't do that because of, of himself, but because I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And what did Jesus say? He ever liveth to make intercession for us. And he intercedes on our behalf that our faith fails not. So when you say that you can lose your faith, that the just will not live by their faith, not only are you contradicting the word in numerous applications, but you're calling Jesus a liar. You will hold fast that confidence because you have overcome. And that's why he says you can be sure. That whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And overcometh is an ongoing, present tense reality. You are overcoming. And yet it is also future tense. You have overcome and you will overcome. You understand? And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We have gotten the victory. I have overcome the world, so be of good cheer, says Jesus in John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you that you that you might have that in me you might have peace in the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. Because I have overcome, and therefore so shall you. For I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. And I have declared it unto them thy name and will declare it that the love where they have loved me may be in them and I in them. 
Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We have, are, we're already in heavenly places. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We are in Christ. We are in heaven with him already because we are the body of Christ. We have been chosen in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love because we have been predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of whose will? His will. For it is not of him nor, nor who runneth, nor of him that willeth, but of him that showeth mercy. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. We know that the perfection to come is this. For we know in part, and we prophesize in part, but then when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Okay? For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even also as I am known. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. We will receive our glorified bodies. Okay, and on and on it goes. We have been made, we are been made liberty. We have become doers of the word. And we, will re we are sanctified forever. We have the joy. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. We have pleasures forevermore. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand. They, they, there are, are pleasures forevermore. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is a fountain of life, and thy light shall we see light. I could go on and on about all this, brothers and sisters, but I think I'm going to end this here. Stand fast in the liberty. Know that you are a doer of the word because, because being a doer refers to a single act, which is faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Okay? You have been given a liberty, so be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You have been perfected forever. Jesus Christ said it himself in Hebrews 10, 10 through 14. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Grieve not the spirit, you have been for forgiven. Pleasures forevermore await you, and perfection of the body is to come. So God bless, brothers and sisters, that is the meaning of grace. And there is a lot of meanings and apprehensions here. God bless you. Amen and amen. You are secure. You are ready to go in the rapture because Jesus Christ has made you ready. He will preserve you blameless. He intercedes on your behalf. You were chosen in foreknowledge. You have been made a vessel unto honor. You have been made a vessel unto mercy. God is not going to fail because faithful is he that promised. You will endure because he is praying for you, because he is in your corner and works all things towards good, you that believe, towards those that are called according to his purpose. All things will be worked towards good just as they were for Joseph. You are kept. You are sealed. You are prepared because Jesus Christ is with you. God bless.